Hello everybody and welcome to our webinar about North East Cambridge Area Action Plan. Thanks everybody for coming today. Um, we are going to be talking about walking and cycling and, and connectivity and transport generally today. Um, I'm just firstly going to just introduce all the fantastic team members that we've got here today from, from various parts of our service and in fact not just our service um, today who are going to be here to answer all of your questions um, and then I'll do a little bit of housekeeping but first just to introduce everybody maybe we can start with Terry. Good afternoon everyone uh, my name is Terry D'Souza I'm a Principal Planning Policy Officer at the Greater Cambridge Share Planning Service uh, I've been one of the officers that's been involved in preparing the AAP and a number of the evidence-based documents that underpins it. Thanks Terry and Matt. Afternoon everyone, I'm Matthew Patterson. I am the, one of the project leads on the, preparing the AAP for the Shared Planning Service. And Claire? Hello everyone, I'm Claire Spencer. Uh, senior Planning Policy Officer in the Greater Cambridgeshire Planning Team, um, also been part of preparing the, the Area Action Plan. Thanks Claire and John? Good afternoon everyone, I'm Jonathan Brooks, a Principal Urban Designer in the Greater Cambridgeshire Planning Service and I've been involved in helping to prepare the spatial framework and supporting policies. And Sarah? Good afternoon everyone, I'm Sarah Hatcher, I'm one of the office officers from the uh, Transport Strategy Team at Cambridge County Council and I've been helping the um, Shared Planning Service and colleagues on the call today um, with the development of the um, transport side of uh, the plan. Thanks so much. So we've got all the people who know lots about transport to answer your questions. Just a little bit about how the webinars work. We will give a very short um, presentation on some of the kind of key themes and issues around the, the topic today. Um, it's an hour long. You'll see at the bottom of your Zoom window, there's a Q&A uh, button. And if you press that, you can enter any questions that you have for the team. And then we'll start going through them at the end live and give as much detail as we can on them. Just so you know, it is being recorded today um, and we do put these up on YouTube afterwards so that anyone who couldn't attend today for whatever reason can watch them back. You are all invisible and anonymous for that reason to protect privacy um, and your names won't be read out on screen either when we read out the questions. So do feel free to please start answer, asking any questions you want um, and um, you know we, we will answer them due course. Just so you know, um, it is just an hour. If we have questions left at the end, um, please we, don't worry. We will answer them online as well. We will put in, we, what we do is we put them into the FAQ page on our website. So again, we can um, let you know where that is at the, end of the, at the end of the presentation. So without further ado, uh, I can see actually just one question. Someone has asked if they're, they're the speakers are okay. I hope everyone can hear okay. I see that one of the other attendees has said they can. Um, I'm sorry if you're having any audio difficulties. We do know, of course, sometimes internet isn't brilliant, um, but we will. We do record them and usually the quality is quite good. So if you do have any problems, you can come back um, and, and watch them back as well on YouTube. So Terry is going to, oh no, uh, oh, hold on a minute. No, I am going to give the presentation, aren't I, Terry? Apologies. Um, I am going to give a presentation today um, and then Terry I think is going to moderate all the questions. I've got all our roles back to front today. Um, I'm going to just share my screen. Sorry, just get my... Right, there we are. So just a bit about the North East Area Action Plan in general terms, um, and then we'll also go on to some of the specific parts about walking and cycling and so forth. Um, just for those of you who aren't already quite familiar with the site, it is a really significant area of brownfield land 
uh, in the northern part of the city and one of the things which we will obviously be talking about more today is about its good transport accessibility and how that's going to improve. That's really one of the key reasons why we are developing an area action plan for this site because it is such a fantastic opportunity to create genuinely sustainable development in a very accessible part of the city. It has a range of landowners, hence we do need this coordinated planning framework, which is, is what the Area Action Plan will provide, because it is this strategically important site, as well as a very locally important site, and it is very important that some of the communities around North East Cambridge, which are some of the more deprived ones in Greater Cambridge, are genuinely at the heart of this and do benefit from the jobs, the services and the housing that's going to be created. In case you're not familiar with what an area action plan is, it is basically similar in status to a local plan. So it sets out a spatial framework to, for development alongside the thematic policies that will guide new planning applications in the area and how we determine them in the future. It has a very, very extensive evidence base of studies that support it because it does have a very large level of weight in the planning process like a local plan would do. So it goes through this examination process with an independent inspector as well. So it does take a little bit of time to get through the system and you can read a bit more about that if you're interested on our website in terms of the timescales that we're looking at. But once it is in place, it's a very powerful tool for us and we would be expecting applicants who come forward in this area to show that they are meeting the policies and the requirements set out in the AAP. This is the vision that we are consulting on as part of the draft area action plan at the moment. And it is very much about what a forward thinking new low carbon city district really means in practice. So that is absolutely centrally about walkability and about sustainable transport. It is also about this mix of uses that is fully integrated with our surrounding neighbourhoods. And that is another way of making sure that it is not just socially sustainable, but it's also economically and into carbon terms, environmentally sustainable as well, with people able to walk and cycle to everything they need on a daily basis. A few headline figures. Uh, currently inside the AAP site boundary, there are 15,000 jobs on the science parks and the business parks and the industrial areas, but only three homes. So a key aim here is to rebalance that and provide more homes within that walking and cycling distance of jobs in the area. So the headline figures are that we hope to create around 8,000 new homes for about 18,000 people. And the target is for 40% of those new homes to be genuinely affordable. There will also be more jobs in the area as well. We're looking at intensifying employment in the site. But then it isn't just about jobs and homes. It is very much about what the green spaces and the site services are that come with them. There are over 10 hectares planned large scale public parks and squares and that's not including the smaller neighbourhood spaces as well that we'll be creating like playgrounds and street spaces as well. So just a bit about walking, cycling and reducing car use in the plan. It is really central and I think one of the things that is so important for, and that why this, we're glad to have you all here today is that actually this vision for sustainable transport is central to the plan. We have put this at the heart of how we've developed the plan from day one. And that is not just about meeting our climate change commitments, but of course that is really important. That is also about the impact on local communities. Milton Road is at capacity anyway, so we really can't be planning for anything that increases road traffic along that as a key artery. Um, but really, you know, it is the right thing to do for so many reasons. Climate, we can't meet our zero carbon targets without this fundamental shift away from car use. Air quality, you know, we know how important that is. And of course, COVID-19 has highlighted that again for us about walking and cycling and people's health and well-being in their own neighbourhoods being so critical. And of course, creating a community that really feels like a genuine neighbourhood here. It's got to be somewhere that doesn't feel carved up and segregated by massive highways anymore, that actually feels really well integrated with its surroundings. So you can see some of the sort of headline measures that are in the area action plan here, um, including really reorientating the streetscape towards pedestrians and cyclists first and cars very much down the pecking order, improving connections into surrounding areas, um, more public transport as well, and then how do we control parking and vehicle movements. 
one of the key drivers here is about everything being on within a short walk or, or maybe a very short cycle ride of your front door and that's um, a, a very key measure because it means it reduces the need to travel out of the area to meet daily needs. So if you're going to school, if you're popping to the shops, if you're going to the library, if you're going out for a meal in the evening, you shouldn't be needing to get in your car at all to do that. The converse of that is that we also don't want North East Cambridge to be, if you like, a destination for people from a much wider area around the site, which would create car trips into the area. So this is about meeting local needs in the local area, not creating somewhere that is going to have lots of people wanting to drive in from outside of North East Cambridge or the, the surrounding communities um, and bringing their cars with them. One of the key things is, of course, that commuting in and out of the area can be done by bike, bus and train because of the really good public transport that exists and they're being improved as part of the plan. As we've mentioned, the, the location is key here. So, you know, it is 15 minute cycle ride from the city centre. And of course, with things like the Chisholm Trail, it means that cycling north and south down, down to the south of Cambridge and so forth will become much easier as well. Um, and it is a 15 minute walk from north to south across the site and a 30 minute walk east to west. So one of the things is at the moment you would feel Milton Country Park is absolutely miles away from, you know, from the busway and so forth because you have to cross quite a lot of barriers and so forth to get there. But of course, what we're looking at in the plan is to break down some of those barriers to movement to create new ways of crossing across from different parts of the site and, and around its boundaries so that it really does feel incredibly accessible to go from north to south and east to west across the site. This just shows some of those potential connections that we're consulting on. And this is where it's really important that we hear from you as well. If you think these are in the right place, we need to hear that. If you also think we've got some of these things wrong, we really want to hear about that too. But as you can see, there are several really significant connections that are being made, either new ones or improving some of, some of the existing ones, like the Jane Coston Bridge. So the Jane Coston Bridge, for instance, we're looking at improving the links either side of that so that it becomes as well used as it possibly can. But we're also looking at a new underpass between Milton Country Park and the site itself as well, so that the Greenway cycle route down from Water Beach can actually come into the site very seamlessly under the A14. You can see that there's a pedestrian and a cycle bridge over the railway line being proposed through Chesterton Fen, so that would meet up with the towpath cycle routes there. Better connections across Milton Road and also a lot of better connections across the guided busway as well to really break down those as barriers to movement. So it is about stitching North East Cambridge into its context and meaning that if you live in King's Hedges or Chesterton or Arbury, it's really easy for you to move through the site, access the services, access the jobs and so forth there without using a car. This just shows, um, again, a little bit more simplified, the primary sustainable travel routes that are being proposed. And again, these are consultation at the moment and draft, so we really want to hear what you will think about them. The yellow are the primary strategic routes for pedestrians and cyclists. So those are the routes that allow you to get across the site, through the site and connect up with the other off-road and protected cycle routes around the area. Then we have um, the proposed bus route through the site as well. So that will meet up with Milton Road. Um, and then what we're looking at are really integrated mobility hubs. So not just a, a bus stop where you can get on and off your bus, but also actually cycle hire and all of those other really important things that allow you to continue your journey from when you get off your bus or your guided bus. And we're looking at a new guided busway stop as well, just here. The street hierarchy is really important. So we're saying that whilst the thicker white lines on this map are what we're calling the primary streets, um, and they will allow motorised traffic through traffic, if you like, to come through the area and service businesses and so forth. Or the thinner white lines, which are we're calling the secondary streets, are basically no through routes. So we are really discouraging people to use them unless they absolutely need to take a delivery and so forth. You can also see that we're proposing 
a rather different approach to parking in this in this image here. So rather than parking at your doorstep, which I think a lot of people are obviously used to, we're looking at consolidating parking for residents in what we're calling car barns. So those are essentially more consolidated, multi-storey car parks that will probably be wrapped with homes or offices or other development. And they will be a short walk away from your house, but it is about saying they are somewhere you can store your car if you need a car for the weekend, or if you want to hire a, a pool car or a zip car or something like that from a car club, you can have that in those car barns, but you're not encouraged to use them on a sort of daily basis. So just a little bit more about how these new style streets could look and feel. This is showing the primary streets. So these are the sort of three routes, if you like, where we're looking at a fully segregated cycle and pedestrian routes, which you can see running down to the side here, away from vehicle traffic, which would be buses and so forth. Um, and you can see really the generosity of that street section and how it is about prioritising walking and cycling and ensuring that vehicles have to go slower, have to slow down and allow people to cross and so forth, as well as some of the greening that is obviously going to be really important to making this a wonderful place to live. You can see here again the idea about the mobility hub, which is that if you get off your bus, you could then hire a bike, you could then cycle your kind of last five minutes or ten minutes or however, uh, wherever you're going in the area. So again, you're not having to rely on a car or any other sort of form of motorised transport for those short kind of trips. This is showing those secondary streets. So this is a higher density version. And here we're really taking um, many cues from our, from our colleagues over on the other side of the channel in, in Holland and Belgium, where they have mastered the art of making streets where you're not banning cars. This is absolutely not about banning cars from the area. You'll still be able to drive like the delivery van here, you know, drop off things. If you are a blue badge holder, you'll be able to park outside your home. But it is about saying that those vehicle movements are subservient to the walking and the cycling and they have to go really slowly. And that makes space for play, that makes space for people to informally socialise on the street as well as much more space for greening the street as well. Just a couple of sort of examples from other places about how that can look and feel when it, it, it's a mature and, and um, finished place. So you can see that cars are allowed but they are very much second fiddle to the cycling and the walking and the kind of green space creating a much more attractive and much more family friendly, pedestrian friendly environment. And this is showing how a slightly different version of this might work in a residential area with medium density street. So we have a few questions that have been coming up regularly on social media and things like that, which we thought we would answer first. Um, and I now need to consult my notes because I actually can't remember who's answering the first question here. I think this is Matt, isn't it? Lots of people have been hearing this word, the trip budget, which we haven't really mentioned yet so far. So I think Matt was going to unpack this question about what is a trip budget and how will this work in practice? Thanks, Anna. Yeah, so a trip budget is quite unique, really. It's about uh, ensuring that you can enable development to come forward without having a, an impact on the surrounding road networks. Well, we know the local road network on Milton Road and the surrounding areas at capacity. Um, therefore, to enable development come forward uh, on at North East Cambridge, we need to ensure that it does not have a net increase in that in those trip movements. Uh, and how we do this is by allocating the existing trips, if you like, that already happen within NEC to each of the development areas. So each of the developers therefore have a cap on the number of trips that they can make and overall those trips cannot exceed those that are already carried out on the network. Um, we have uh, ways and means of doing that. Obviously, first and foremost is ensuring the place is, is uh, designed such that it uh, facilitates a trip budget approach. Um, we limit, can limit the number of car parking spaces on individual sites as well to ensure that that happens. Um, but primarily it's about driving up the level of um, sustainable transport that's made. So it's a huge um, shift away from vehicle movement through to about a 70% share of all movements being made by sustainable modes across the area as a whole. Um, so at the moment, we did, the county did lots of modelling for us originally 
and our consultants to, to determine exactly how many vehicle movements there are at the AM and PM peak on Milton Road. So we know exactly how many vehicles are coming into the area at those times. And that's what the um, peak capacity is. And that's what the trip budget's set upon, if you like. And then that's allocated out to each of the development areas. For existing sites, it means they have to significantly reduce the amount of um, vehicle movements into their area. And for those new developments that are coming on board, they need to stick within their budget and ensure that there is significant sustainable transport measures put in place to facilitate that, that mode share that needs to happen. Um, all of this means that we don't have to do huge amounts of new highways engineering works around Milton Road, around the A14 as well, um, to, to get more traffic and vehicles into the area, which just makes it unsustainable. The Northeast Cambridge already benefits significantly from um, uh, sustainable transport, whether it's cycling, train, the bus, we've got Cambridge Metro coming as well, um, and we can build on that and ensure that it is a sustainable place. Thanks, Matt. Okay, so the, the second of the three questions um, that we're going to just cover now are, is, um, won't everybody park on streets outside of the Northeast Cambridge area? Um, so I think that's Sarah, I believe, that's going to be picking up on that one. Yep, thank you, Terry. That's, it, that's a really good question. Um, and it's important because clearly by restricting um, parking at North East Cambridge, we don't want to simply displace that problem into neighbouring areas. So we know that the availability of parking is a big driver in um, people's decision on whether to drive or not to predominantly work at the moment, obviously, at North East Cambridge, um, even if there are alternatives. So we know that the science park and the other business parks in the areas um, have um, pretty much unconstrained prolific parking um, on their sites so there's no real incentive for people uh, not to drive to work if that's what they want to do um, so that then feeds through into the clearly into the sort of issues with traffic and, conge and congestion on Milton Road and around the area um, so just in in answering the question there um, I think the first point is that the development won't happen altogether overnight. It's the site is going to be developed out over a number of years. So we're not suddenly going to be faced with hundreds of vehicles that can't park on the site um, and are then looking to, um, to park in neighbouring areas. It will be done in a phased manner. And as the plan progresses, a parking strategy will be developed for the whole site um, which is phased in such a way to um, to make that parking more equitable about uh, across the site um, but it will be phased in such a way that it matches um, when the new transport offer comes on board so you know it would be unreasonable to to take parking away if there's if there aren't alternatives in place for people to use um, I think that the second point to make is that um, obviously you've got an employment element and, you need, and you've got a residential element of the new development. There isn't any residential development there at the moment. So people moving to the site um, are going to be moving there um, in the knowledge um, of the type of um, area it's going to be and the vision for it and um, the, the type of um, place that we want to make it. So I think probably if you're a, a house, a four car household, you might look at the at this site and think it's not for you. Whereas if you're a household that perhaps um, doesn't need a car for so many of your journeys, then then you might consider it. Um, so I think there will be an element of moving into the site in the knowledge um, that there are other options, and I think that's the key to it. it, it as Hannah said earlier, it's not about um, no cars allowed because clearly um, people do need their, their cars and there will be blue badge provision um, and there will be car bonds. So it's not it's not a question of not having a car at all, um, but there are other options. Um, and um, and um, there will be car clubs as well. So um, it's not 
fancy car it's just trying to make the other options the easier choice when you walk outside your front door so it's not trying to put off people um, who need a car but it is um, trying to make the other options kind of more equitable to the car I suppose. Um, in terms of the employment side of it that will be um, more of a challenge I suppose because you do have people um, who are obviously already coming to the science park and the other business parks um, who are driving at the moment and over time um, a, a good proportion of those people will need to change their habits um, so that will be a more a more of a challenge in terms of changing that behavior over time um, and I do acknowledge obviously there is this, um, the concern that those kind of trips could spill over on into neighboring areas um, but um, what we will be doing is we will be monitoring, um, d doing parking monitoring in surrounding areas. So areas, for example, like, like Milton, like the areas to the south of the sites. Um, and as those developments come forward, um, if the monitoring shows that there are, um, there are um, there's increasing parking on those streets, um, then we will have other steps that we can take and other in interventions that we can take through the planning process to, um, to deal with that. Um, I think that probably answers that for the time being. Thank you, Sarah. That's really helpful. Um, I think you also picked up on some of the questions that people have already <laughs> yeah. been leaving in the, in the chat, which is great, um, but we'll come, I'll come back to those. So just the last question before we come on to the ones that have been asked, and there are quite a few actually, so thank you everybody who's asked questions so far um is what about the weekly shop people will still need cars to do to do things like this um so john i think uh, is that you that's picking up this question i do that one terry thanks i mean i think this is a really good point you know people need to be able to live and enjoy living in this area we're not trying to create some sort of um police state um so i, I think you know we need to make sure though that we think about what is the character and quality of the place that we're creating um, and it comes back to the vision for the NEC, which is about kind of everything you need is kind of very local to you. It's sort of on your doorstep. So that's whether you're hopefully you know, working and living in the area or whether you need to go to the shop or to the school. And I think, you know, the, the basis of this, of the framework and the, and the sort of vision is around a kind of really good series of kind of connected streets, um, which are kind of great for uh, walking and cycling and really put those two modes right at the top and that's then supported by a really um, good public transport um, offer so the Cambridge North Station clearly kind of takes you out of that area um, and, and connects you kind of wide more widely in the region the uh, guided bus stop and the extent that you know the increased provision of the guided bus stops to serve the district centre again a really really important component um, so all of these kind of key moves are supported by the draft policies and by the spatial framework. Um, I think the other, the other side of it is about, you know, car ownership patterns are changing both nationally and, and it's sort of reflected in the Cambridge context. Um, and it is increasingly about having access to a vehicle should you need it, um, rather than, you know, owning a vehicle and leaving it in a kind of car parking space or in a garage for the majority of the week. So, you know, as has been mentioned earlier in the presentation, um, sort of access to a car club or to a, you know, a pool car is really important. So if you need to go and do your Ikea run, or if you need to go and do your weekly shop, these things are available to you, um, but you may choose to use that rather than owning your own um, private vehicle. And the other key component is, and it's again reflected in, in the draft policies, it's about this sort of idea of a last mile delivery or a delivery hub. So um, if you buy something, it can be delivered and dropped somewhere locally, which you can pick up either on your way back from work, um, or if you're out making another a trip somewhere. That can really help to reduce the number of vehicle trips in and around the area, but also mean that you don't need a car to go and pick something up. So I think, um, and, and obviously, you know, your, your local kind of te um, Waitrose, Tesco's, other supermarkets are available deliveries, which may be um, part of how you can deal with the kind of weekly or the sort of bulk buy shop. So I guess in summary, you know, it is a more radical approach, but it's born out of this need to really think carefully about the tip budget, but also reflected in the 
kind of ambition to make this a different um, kind of a place. And I think, you know, whilst it is radical, we believe that through the draft policies and, and, and sort of evidence that we're finding, it's one that can really work in um, North East Cambridge. Thank you, John. That's really helpful. Um, I just wanted to start picking up now on some of the questions that are in the Q&A um, feed. So the first one um, was somebody who's, um, who's got um, health implications and, and unable to kind of walk long distances. And they're, essentially they're asking the question, how would I get to other towns and villages locally without my car? And would I be unwelcome in this development? I think hopefully um, John and Sarah's kind of answers have hopefully picked that up and essentially, no, we really want this to be a very inclusive development. You know, we want, you know, young and old and, and, and everybody to, to feel very welcome here, to, to live here, to visit this place. So um, no, we don't want people to feel, to feel unwelcome, but really we want to make sure that, you know, people, um, that people feel like they can use other modes of transport and not just have to, to rely on the car for every journey. Um, whether that's you know the school run or whether it's you know like John said you know doing your IKEA run so um, so hopefully that that's helped to address that question. There was also a point about parking, uh, sorry about management of displacing parking in neighbouring villages such as Milton and adjacent roads. So hopefully that's already been covered as well by Sarah. I think one that's a really topical uh, question which was asked earlier as well was about COVID and whether COVID related sort of transport issues are being explicitly factored into these plans, e.g. a shift to work from home. So is high density development less favourable moving forward? Um, Matt, is that something that you might be able to pick up on, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think what it's highlighted, in particular the, the latest COVID lockdown, is, is um, how important our cycle and our walking networks are. Um, and so essentially we're trying to build on that um, at this point in time and ensure that that's you know part and parcel of what we're seeking to do here. Um, certainly the, those kind of transport options are where we see um, North East Cambridge taking the lead. Um, we understand obviously the implications currently of used, using public transport and um, people are put off by getting on the buses and things like that at the moment. Um, within North East Cambridge, you will still have sustainable transport modes, the guided busway and others. Um, but it's more about th those strategic cycle and walking connections too. Um, we don't really know what the long-term implications will be of COVID or whether there could be another pandemic uh, that may follow in the future. Uh, so we've got a kind of watching brief at the moment to understand where we're going to go with this. Um, certainly around the development form where we're working with uh, landowners and others to understand more what it means for new office buildings in the area. Do we need as much? Um, we're certainly working with our colleagues around what is required for people's mental health and well-being in terms of um, the access to open spaces um, and also we, we all appreciate most of us are still working from home and um, and we're looking at whether actually we need to make provision within new housing to accommodate that going forward and ensure that there are spaces set aside specifically for uh, needing to work, whether that's us or the kids or whoever it might need to be, it just can't be at the kitchen table anymore. Um, so, like I said, we've got a watching brief at the moment um, and we are looking at all the implications and, and they cross every spectrum really, from the transport right through to dwellings, but also to the types of community facilities we may put in. Um, and we'll look at government guidance and we'll look at best practice as well. Thank you, Matt. Um, we've got a couple of questions here about uh, about Fen Road, and this was something that uh, has come up uh, several times, um, both at the last round of consultation and since. Um, so th there's a lot of support for a road bridge rather than just a pedestrian or cycle link across the railway connecting into Chesterton Fen. This would make the route into the city centre and the Chisholm Trail much safer for the high numbers travelling from North East Cambridge and free up the towpath for pedestrians as Fen Road would be more attractive for cycling. It would also help solve the current issues with delays at the level crossing, um, which Network Rail highlighted to us um, is an issue at the North Area Committee a few months ago. 
uh, and antisocial driving in East Chesterton, has a road crossing been looked at? And if so, kind of where where might that be possible? Um, is that something, Claire, you might be able to pick up on, or is that a question from Matt? Matt, can oh, I go with you? Nice. <laughs> <laughs> you want I'm happy yeah. to. Yeah, I mean, it, it is a, an issue that we're aware of, obviously, um, and we, we obviously want to address, as, as local authorities, the potential severance of a community due to the increased train uh, use on the line and therefore the closing or potential closing of that level crossing. Um, however, the areas outside of the AAP and that's specifically because area action plans are meant to focus on areas of development solely. So where you put a red line boundary, uh, you, you're expecting development to come forward. Uh, the Chesterton Fend area is, is flood plain, but it's also green belt and it's a traveler community as well. Um, therefore, it was never appropriate and it wasn't in, intended, I don't think, through either of the local councils to, to look at further development there. However, we realise that, um, and some work has been done in looking at um, options, if you like, for providing road access, alternative road access, um, should, should the level crossing close. Uh, there's further work that needs to be done, and in particular with Network Rail and others who the combined authority who are the transport authorities for here uh, and have uh, a significant role to play in, in um, determining which of those options is the uh, preferred. What we have, however, done is looked at whether one of those options could be coming through into northeast Cambridge. If that's one of the options that is taken forward, we are looking at setting aside uh, a route to facilitate that. That would be uh, just north of the aggregates uh, depot at the moment. Um, so north of the station um, and would need to obviously come in and then connect through. Uh, it would add to our trip budget obviously, um, but the cycling pedestrian bridge uh, proposal into that community is to help facilitate both uh, people living at North East Cambridge to access uh, the, the river and the towpath and, and the fen, but also for those traveller communities and others to access um, the amenities and services that will be provided at North East Cambridge. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Matt. Um, I'm just looking through the question. There was one I wanted to ask Claire about regarding uh, mobility Oops, I've just lost it. We've got so many through. Um, sorry. Um, oh, would, yes. Mobility hubs include cycles appropriate for those with mobility issues like e bikes and tricycles. Yeah, thanks. Sorry. Um, yeah, that's right. So, mobility hubs are, are designed to um, assist people with their, their whole journey. So, whether you arrive or, or leave by public transport and then want to pick up another form of transport for the first and last mile of your journey. So the, at the hubs themselves, we, we anticipate there will be some cycle parking, so um, people will be able to leave a, a cycle of, of whatever uh, form they need, whether that's a, a conventional cycle or um, a less conventional cycle, like a, a tricycle or some of the other, other um, cargo cycles and other styles of bikes that we get these days. We recognise that we, we need to provide appropriate space for all types of cycles. Um, so it also, um, so it's, it's about interchanging with, with different modes and um, of course we don't know what the future might bring in, in terms of um, whether that's the autonomous vehicles or autonomous pods for example that might be able to act like a like a taxi for your onward journey perhaps if you're getting off at the station you want to go to the science park there may be, well be little shuttles that will, will take you for those that are unable to walk or cycle, for example. So yeah, we're, we're trying to build in, in flexibilities for, for trying to cater for everybody, be all inclusive, whatever mode of transport you might want, whether it's a cycle, whether it's a scooter, an e-bike, 
e-scooter um, and whatever the future may bring with, with us. Great. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, there's a question here about what is planned for Mere Way. Um, is that something that Sarah, you might be able to help with? And I know that there's some plans for Mere Way at the moment um, that are coming through as part of another scheme, is that right? Uh, that's right, Terry. Yeah, um, there were some improvements to the Mere Way secured through the Water Beach um, development. Um, possibly not the place to go into a huge amount of detail here, but I'm sure that we could pick it, pick it up um, outside in the FAQs or um, perhaps um, provide some some further links. Um, yeah, I don't I don't have too much detail to hand at the moment, but happy to to follow that up. I think effectively, um, I think what the plan is saying is that all of the kind of um, planned and, um, and sort of under construction routes that are happening within the area, whether it's the Chisholm Trail or the Milton Road um, cycle improvements or the Mere Way um, works, that they would, you know, North East Cambridge would effectively kind of be that, that place in the middle of a lot of those schemes. So where some of those schemes would come to an end, um, you know, um, we think that it's, you know, it's really important that North East Cambridge, uh, you know, actually facilitates connecting all of those routes up together. Um, and we've tried to show that in the spatial framework and a lot of the kind of connectivity plans within the AAP. Um, but I suppose what would be a really good opportunity as part of this consultation is if, if people think that actually we haven't got all of those connections right. So I don't know if the Mere Way scheme and um, the Milton Road improvements that are happening um, through the GCP, whether you know we could do something better to connect those two schemes. Actually, maybe that's something that people could sort of tell us as part of that, as part of the consultation process. Um, so we can look at that in a bit more detail to understand, you know, the, the journeys that are really important to local people, um, and and how we can actually try and try and join those dots together. Really, uh, Hannah, did you want to ask the next question? Yeah. We were just going to pick up, we're seeing an, a number of questions here about um, people working on the science park and the modal share for commuting. So there's a question, how many people currently work in the science park and what is the share, modal share for commuting? How much does that need to shift to meet the commendable objectives in this plan? And just along the same theme, there are a couple of other questions. So someone has said, people who can't get their staff to the science park easily with easy parking, they will just move location. Many people come from far and wide, often with quick client meetings, etc. Not everybody wants or can work from home and live life on Zoom. Um, and I'm just trying to pick up the ones that are all sort of slightly related. I have a feeling there might have been one. No, I think those were the two that were about that. I think they are really interesting questions about how we, we work and what we um, want from our workplaces and one of the things that we're aware of is that you know Cambridge and, and the science parks have an amazing reputation for attracting talent and retaining talent in the area but what those talented people want is really changing and if you look at the tech industries and you know you look at what life is like in Shoreditch or in San Francisco those are the places that Cambridge is competing with for talent so we need to make a place that is feels as accessible and as, as wonderful to live in as those places and they actually don't depend on people driving they don't depend on people having to get in a car to come to work and lots of the new generations of people who are coming into those jobs we are hearing from those employers and we are hearing from those employees as well that they would like the lifestyle in Cambridge that they can enjoy in some of these other really important cities. So yes, I mean, there are, and I'm sure probably some colleagues can pick up on the, the modal shift stuff about this in a bit more detail and perhaps we can provide, rather than read out lots of statistics right now, we can provide a written answer on some of that. But I think we, we do need to be aware that the world is very much changing and if we're going to keep attracting the great employers, the great tech companies, We've got to make Google and HQ and all those sorts of employers want to be in Cambridge and not um, move down to other places. Thank you, Hannah. Um, there was a question that I wanted to pick up on about bikes desk, which um, I know is a big issue, um, not just in Cambridge, but also in North, North East Cambridge as well. So what consideration will be given to the security of park bikes? Um, as the current levels of theft are discouraging many people from cycling, North Cambridge has particularly high levels of theft. Uh, John, could you could you pick that one up, please? Uh, yes. Okay. Thanks, Terry. I mean, cycle theft is a is a big issue across the whole city, clearly, um, and we want to make sure that we kind of minimise that. So there are a sort of number of approaches we can take. And I think about having kind of activity and good surveillance 
um, on streets. So actually you've got people walking and moving around it is a key deterrent to um, making sure that things aren't kind of uh, done out of sight, out of mind. Um, but I think, you know, the policy as well in the, in the draft AAP is very specific about the requirement for safe and secure cycle parking. Um, that's well related to the um, either homes it serves or to um, the businesses. Um, that's really, really important. And we've mentioned or talked very briefly earlier about kind of off gauge cycles, those non standard ones, which are increasingly part of that kind of Cambridge offer. Um, making sure that cycle storage accommodates these things, making sure that cycle stores have space where you can put a maintenance stand in, you can have a, a, a bicycle pump. All of these things come down to the sort of more technical requirements through the actual kind of design of buildings but they're as important really as making sure that the streets are active and well surveilled. The other point is around the mobility hubs. These are areas of where, where you will be able to um, change from one mode to another. So you might park your bike and get on a bus to get out of the area. Again, really important that these things are covered by good CCTV um, and they're in areas which are again supported by the activity um, and people around which will help to deter um, kind of bike theft. Thank you, John. Um, and then I've got, there's two questions here, which I'm going to roll into one. Uh, Matt, this is going to be coming your way. So will properties be actively marketed as suitable for low or low car ownership? And will the spaces within the car barns be free or be paid for in places where this has happened, e.g. Uh, Vauban in Freiburg, Germany? It's successfully reduced car ownership levels to 164 vehicles per thousand people compared with 600 um, vehicles per 1,000 people in the wider area. So will they be actively marketed as low car ownership or no car ownership and will the car barns be free for people? Okay, um, so on the marketing, yes, uh, we will be working hard with all of the developers around actively marketing the culture of the place that we want to see embedded through the AAP itself. Um, the expectation is that this is a walkable, cyclable neighbourhood. People coming to live here will want to and should be um, fully engaged in that enterprise really um, and shouldn't come with an expectation that, that it's, it's business as normal or as usual. Um, and we want certainly where we can promote low car uh, development that's what we're aiming for in particular around um, office buildings and things like that we certainly see you don't have to have the huge amounts of car parking associated with every office development to make them attractive to the marketplace to make them attractive to tenants in fact the tenants want something completely different they want all their local amenities and other things like that. And if you've got good sustainable transport, there's no reason to have those. In terms of the car barns themselves, like we said, a lot of it will be just um, car storage more than car parking for the barns. Uh, I envisage they'd be operated on a lease basis and that lease basis would be uh, would require payment really um, and it would all depend on the specific circumstances that, that each individual has in terms of how much you you could afford to pay or uh, are required to pay and it's not so much about putting people off like we said it's it's not so much putting people off owning a car but there are better alternatives to everyone to owning a car whether that's having a pool vehicle uh, and um or or access to a car um, by other means so uh we're still to work out the details i think on the exact nature of the the how the barns would work in reality but essentially that's where we see it going Thank you, Matt. So I've got a design question now. Hopefully that'll be a good one for John. So can the cycle a walking bridge over Milton Road be a green bridge like that on Mile End Road, which is in London, uh, which is wide with grass and trees rather than a narrow steel structure? Uh, the underpass near the roundabout, uh, which I think is the A14 one being referred to, will be very long and unpleasant. So uh, two parts to that question, John. Yes, I mean, I think it's fair to say we're not at the sort of design stage for these um, key connections. 
yet. So I don't think we can kind of categorically say it's going to be like mile end, although that is a fantastic example. I think what we found through um, the typologies work, which is part of the evidence base that supports the AAP, is that there are a number of really good ways of providing high quality connections, whether they are through kind of underpasses or um, over bridges. I think the key thing is about the quality of the connection. And so we need these things to be convenient and easy to use. They need to be kind of seamless. Um, and I think that's one of the key reasons why we've changed the kind of emphasis of what Cowley Road does as it kind of bridges over um, Milton Road and, and towards the science park. So we don't want to create very circuitous routes. We want them to be high quality. If they can be widened and they can be green and they can extend the landscape across, that would be fantastic. But we're not quite at that stage yet. Thanks, John. Um, I've, I've noticed that we've got around 10 minutes left of the, of the session. Um, I just wanted to say that if you do have any questions, um, please do put them in the Q&A at the bottom. And any that we don't manage to answer within the time, we will put a written response online. So when the video of this recording goes online, there'll be a written response to all of the questions that we weren't able to get to. So um, if you've got any burning questions and we can't answer them, then don't worry, they will be answered. They'll just be done um, in words rather than um, visually and audio, uh, audio right now. Okay, um, Hannah, there's a question which I'm, I'm going to send your way. Hopefully you might be able to help. So at what point in the future does the council expect its carbon reduction plan to produce a notable effect on the global climate? I understand that at best, even the net zero carbon across the globe, this will not have any effect before 20, uh, sorry, 2000, uh, 2100 at the earliest. How will the public be able to review this progress? So I think this is a really brilliant question about how small things add up to big changes in the world, because of course Cambridge and South Cambridge councils on their own aren't going to stop climate change in their tracks. But we are working towards this kind of wider government target of net zero by 2050, and that will be monitored. Um, and, and the government is put, starting to put in place, I mean, this is obviously a very new target for us all to be working to, but they are going to start putting in place ways for that to be monitored. I'm sure that we are going to keep arguing about the science here to some degrees and, and how much impact that genuinely has. And I think there are some unknowns here, but we know that it's the right thing to do. And it's just so important that we embrace this challenge and we do the most that we possibly can. We have a lot of discussions in the team about what net zero really means. And we're constantly reviewing some of the science around that. And we actually have some really great studies going on on exactly this to support not only the AAP, but also the local plan. So I'll, I'll probably try and dig out a, a link for you, but there are um, there, there is a, a wider net zero and, and low carbon strategy and study being done, which will actually start to quantify some of this stuff. It's not all kind of ready yet for publication, but I'll dig out a link and put it in with the FAQs that we put online, as Terry mentioned, um, so that the person who asked that question, you can definitely have a look at that evidence base and see what you think about the way we're measuring it and see whether you think maybe we could do better on that as well. Thanks, Anna. It turns out I can't say the, the number 2100. <laughs> it's so far into the future, I can't even say it. <laughs> okay, um, I've, got, I've got another question here. I don't know if it's a question or whether it's actually it's um, a suggestion actually to go in um, as someone's consultation response. But, um, has the council ever considered building a monorail system that could literally go over the top of existing roads? It seems the whole development is about slowing people down, making things local, which could be great for some, as you say, but transportation should still be fast and efficient. The concentration on bikes and walking seems disappointingly. I realise it's very Cambridge, but I'm surprised the future is looking so slow. Even the park and rides are tediously slow. Um, I think that's <laughs> I think that's a fair comment. Um, I think yeah, like I said, um, you know that we have looked at a range of sort of different different approaches for northeast Cambridge, and um, the, if you look at the the transport um, evidence that kind of sits behind the, the draft plan at the moment, it sort of talks about how you could improve connectivity not only to the wider area um, and the kind of you know the city centre and um, Adam Brooks and, and places like, like that, but also about how you can improve internalisation. So that's about how people uh, move around and stay within the site as well. So how do you get across from the east side of Milton Road to the west side of Milton Road and things like that. So um, I think that's um, that's a you know a good point but um i think a monorail is something that we haven't really looked at in too much detail at the moment i think one of the things that does feed into that is also the cam 
um, which has been looked at at the moment by the combined authority. So obviously it's not a monorail in itself, but uh, what they are proposing at the moment would be a, a tunnel or portal at Cambridge North Station um, that would then feed across the site along the existing guided busway, uh, most likely, uh, and then go north one towards Water Beach and also towards St Ives as it does at the moment on the um, guided busway. So yes, there are there are a few ideas in, in uh, you know that are possible at North East Cambridge. But if you've got any other suggestions, then then please do respond to the um, consultation. I should just say that um, all of the all of the questions and that that we've had in here are great uh, and all of the other sessions, but we do really need your comments in writing through the proper consultation channel. Um, oh, and just like that, Joe's going to share the screen. That's a really good plug. Um, so uh, yeah, so if you've got any suggestions, any ideas, um, if you um, support elements of the plan, your objective elements of the plan, or, or you're neutral and you just want to make comments, then please, please, please do. Um, submit your comments to us before the 5 p.m. deadline on the 5th of October. Uh, we also have another Q&A session, which will be the last one, the eighth one and final one um, coming up, and that's just a general one, so it's not going to be themed like this one is. Um, and there's more information on that slide there. But we've got about five more minutes left, so I'm going to try and get through some more questions. Um, so where are we? So uh, let's have a look. Um, how do how do people manage bike theft in the Netherlands? Um, because and it, you know is bike theft a problem there? And if not, how do they manage that? John or Matt? I'm happy to. I mean, I've spent time in the Netherlands, uh, and it's prolif prolific. Unfortunately, it's prolific everywhere. Uh, it's just that um, everyone goes for it for the cheaper. Um, sort of bikes because of the understanding that um, it's still the easiest way to get around um, but obviously they're less desirable to be stolen um, but it, it's just the nature of, of it. It's really unfortunate and there are lots of things you can do um, in particular about uh, the types of locks and things you put on but most of it comes down to, to surveillance at the end of the day and people being vi more vigilant really. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and then there's a question here, and th this is actually from a recent article um, saying that the development at North East Cambridge will be amongst the most dense in terms of population in Europe, higher than London. Is this true? And it does suggest that there's too much being too much housing being planned here. I think Hannah wanted to pick up on some of that, and I don't know if John wanted to as well, but Hannah, I'll start um, with you. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that this, I had to, did see this comment come in um, in an article recently, and I think if I'm really honest, there's a little bit of a misunderstanding here between some of the figures. We did have a webinar on housing and density actually last week, so there's some more detail on some of this stuff then, but just in really broad terms, we're looking at around sort of 200, 250, um, up to 300 homes a hectare across most of the residential development areas in northeast Cambridge. What that means, because I know that people say, well, what on earth does that mean? <laughs> well, it's quite difficult to understand, but I think a, a good comparison would actually be somewhere like Notting Hill in London, if people have watched the movie or been there themselves. Those sorts of mansion block, kind of taller, um, you know, mid 19th century buildings are about 250 homes a hectare. And they have a really great amenity space. They have wonderful shared gardens in the back. And in a way, whilst obviously we're not building 19th century style blocks here, we are looking at many similar themes. So in terms of the density, if that helps you visualize it, that's what we're looking at. London is quite low density. So if you took the entirety of London inside the M25 and you averaged it out, you would get quite a low density. And we are gonna be looking at a higher density than that. But what we really are looking at is something much more comparable to some of those more central areas, Islington, Notting Hill, um, you know, some parts of Southwark and places like that. Um, and it is definitely not going to be one of the most dense in terms of population in the whole of Europe. If you look at, you know, central Paris and places like that, much, much denser in terms of population. Thank you, Hannah. Um, I know we've reached half past, but I'm going to do one more question. So it says here, you mentioned weekly Waitrose deliveries here. Uh, have deliveries coming into the site been included in the trip budget calculations or are all deliveries expected to go through the logistics hub? Um, Sarah, is that something you might be able to help with? Or is that a question for Matt? I don't mind, I'll take it. Uh, yeah, they, they have been in terms of 
what the trip budget requires is that all trips are, are taken into account really so that's all the servicing arrangements so that's people um, coming uh, to you know put in your new washer freezer dryer whatever it is um, all of those things to deliveries at uh, the local shops um, to you know people coming in to to do other things within the area um, uh, all of those trips have to be accounted for in the trip budget. So that includes, you know, uh, deliveries by um, your local um, supermarkets too. Ideally, what we're trying to do is intercept those at the fringe, uh, cut off as many as possible through the use of logistics hubs on the fringes of the area and ensuring that that last uh, mile is a last green mile, last three green miles really, or cargo bike or others. Thank you, Matt. Okay, uh, and on that one, I'd just like to say thank you very much for joining us. Um, yeah, apologies, we haven't got around to every question. There were a number, so it's great to see everybody really involved and engaged uh, with this uh, topic in particular. Uh, like I said, we will be responding to all of those um, online um, um, within within the next few days, hopefully by the end of this week. Um, so if your question hasn't been answered, then, then you, you'll see a written response shortly. Um, I'd just like to thank all my panellists and technical support, Joe, as well, for, for helping with this session. Um, and yes, thank you very much. And please don't forget to um, make your comments on the, uh, on the draft plan by the 5th of October. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see you all at the next Q&A session um, in about a week's time. Thank you. Thanks.